Hello YouTube, welcome to another update video. We're on our way to the boat, but first, we need coffee. Thank you very much. Bye. I mean, I didn't even have to get out of my car. <laughs> the modern world is full of wonder. <laughs> that is delightful. So, video update. What have we been doing? Well, we've been fitting the heater, the uh, bilge pumps, uh, and we're starting uh, and have finished the main circuits off in uh, other parts of the boat. Uh, TV is fitted. Uh, we've also got marine radio and GPS. Now, you might think that given that we haven't even got an engine in and we're nowhere near getting launched, that's a little bit premature. But the reason being that we need to make sure the cables are in and also um, we need to have tested the equipment as well. So uh, there's been a little bit of that going off. Diesel heat is going in today. Shouldn't be too big a task, we hope. So what we've got with the kit is this flexible rubbery pipe, which is really, really flexible and would probably, once it's had a bit of fuel in it, will go brittle very quickly. So the alternative is this, which is still plastic, but is much more rigid. And that is the pipe we're going to use. This is the little, uh, so there we've got the fuel goes in there, through the filter, into the pump, out of the pump, that's that new bit of fuel pipe and straight into the heater there. So here it is installed um, and there are effectively there's four pipe connections uh, that you have. Firstly and most importantly is the heated air out. You attach ducting to this to take the warm air to where you want it. At the other end is the cold air inlet. This needs to be led to a source of fresh air either outside or to the cabin. If you leave it unconnected, it might draw smells or even poisonous exhaust gases into the living space. Combustion air is to mix with the fuel for the fire, so it doesn't matter quite as much where this pipe takes its air from. The last of these larger connections is the exhaust pipe, which takes the heater fumes away from the heater, and this must be taken to the outside air. Finally, there's the tiny fuel pipe inlet. So this is the top of the tank, and this is our sender, uh, and that is the pipe that's going off to, you'll see it's copper, I can't tell if you can see that in the picture, um, but uh, that's copper and that's going off to the heater. Now, when we installed it, this is that cheap stuff that comes with, the nice thing about it is it's clear so we can see where the fuel is. Um, I won't bore you with the process, but basically we got the engine, we got the thing started yesterday and um, then it stopped and we think it was fuel so we then had we had an air leak here so we took that was that was a, a little valve we're taking that out now and we've got a direct connection and that stopped the air leak and then we've used that to test uh, what we've got and we're not really sure why it's not getting proper fuel but we're also not really sure that there is proper fuel in this tank um i cut an inspection hatch here um a while ago so that we could see and the uh, the previous owner had said that the diesel tank was empty and it isn't but what it's full of is open to interpretation. Uh, we assumed it was diesel and now we're not absolutely sure. Um, it may be a combination of diesel and water. But in order to get the heater going, uh, we need to know that we're putting proper diesel into it and that it's getting a good supply of good fuel. So I'm using, um, temporarily, I'm gonna use the, uh, the actual uh, bottle that came with it, the, the fuel tank that came with it. So there's my tank. And there's my road diesel that I just purchased about an hour ago from a garage. Now, this took quite a lot of working out because there is apparently a way of priming this pump and it tells you that you can do it and it says you press the button and hold it for three seconds. It didn't tell you which button. So by process of elimination, we eventually worked out it's this one. And there's the pump priming. There we are, there's some. There we go. Yay! 
so there's the heater outlet in the saloon um, it's coming out of the hole it's going to come out of and then there's the the actual heat outlet um, what we've got to do is we're going to get rid of the water there's some standing water in this uh, in this one here um, if you see it almost doesn't it almost looks like plastic um, but it's actually it's actually water um, it's just rainwater that's come in over a period so not overly worried about it but we've got to get rid of it and here is the device which we're going to be able to get rid of it with and the device in question is from the whale super sub range this is a very low profile narrow electric bilge pump comes in a few flavors and mine is the super sub smart 1100 12 volt dc with non-return valve the smart refers to the automatic switch, meaning the pump will sense the presence of water and then switch on and will turn off again when the water level's dropped. The switching solid state and there are no moving parts. And it's also got a time delay so it doesn't start and stop every time the boat rolls a wave of bilge water over the switch. And um, as you can see, that is the uh, bilge pump and it's all ready and plumbed, plumbed in electrically. So we've just got to find a pipe for it and uh, stick it on an outlet hose and then drop it in there and hopefully we'll get rid of the water tonight. There is a bilge, oh there is a, there is a, um, a hose that's already connected from the, for the bilge and I believe this is it. So connecting that onto, pushing that onto there should be fine. Um, it's only a temporary thing, this will just to get rid of the water. Um, and we've got a bit of a clip there. I think we should probably put that on there. Mm -hmm. Now it's got a, a pump a pipe screwed onto it. Um, what we'll do is we'll test the, put it into the automatic mode. And then we should be able to drop it in the water. Because this one, the sensor is on the water. So the sensor is uh, here. So I should get in. And it should start, which it hasn't. No, it has. There you go. Off it goes. Well, there's our first section of bilge water that's been expelled. But you'll see there's no automatic running between these two. So that back one's got a lot of water in it as well. So I need to sort that out too. Now, when I first uh, got down into this space, and some of it uh, was oil. So, and then we use this spill absorb, um, as this has now dried up lovely, into some dust, which is very easy to then just scrape up. And we're left with there. So, I don't know what that green one's for, and I don't know what that green one's for but if I can repatriate that one for the bilge pump the second bilge pump the water puppy one which is this one here uh, that might be quite useful this bilge pump is I think an old Jabsco Maxi Puppy 3000 despite the outer casing being trashed these things are built to last with a simple motor driving an impeller pump the motor works perfectly and with a new impeller it'll be as good as new so I'm happy to keep on using this one as my second pump rather than buy another new one at several hundred pounds it's rated at 600 gallons per hour, so it's not as powerful as the super sub, but with both running, we can get rid of 130 litres every minute. Before we can achieve that though, we need to strip the pump down and give it a good service, starting by replacing the impeller. See that split there. Right, okay, so then we'll take that one off, and that's the bronze pump bit. And then we'll take the back part off. The motor's still good, so we'll uh, we'll crack on. We've got a main socket just there. Um, that's the one, the first one in the wheelhouse. Um, and then they come through on 20 mil conduit, so that's over here. And then you've got a double socket uh, in the galley. This is obviously just a temporary installation, but it. Uh, um, and then you got that one's got a couple of USBs on it and then the 20 mil follows it over there through and then it comes into the floor cabin area 
and here we've got a, a single socket here and then over that side we've got a socket with two USBs on it and the next one in the chain is in the in the head uh, whoa hey there we are um, that's the shaver socket that's really just for uh, charging the toothbrush so that one's uh, just hung on the wall for now we'll worry about the details later and then the 20 mil comes out of the out of the, out on the floor and obviously this is where uh, this that one that double socket there is is going to actually be in the uh, sort of the wall of the sofa um, somewhere along along this line and then it finishes the, the final one is the telly now that's a switched um, fuse there and the reason that's switched is so that we can actually turn the um, we can turn the telly on or turn the telly off and we don't use any standby current um, the problem with having too many USBs is that of course the USBs do use um, quiescent current um, when they're not in use and so does the transformer in the um, uh, in the bathroom so we have uh, I've fitted the radio now you might think that's a tad premature uh, I, and I wouldn't disagree so this is the M423 uh, and the 423G so this is the one with the GPS so it's the same as the one on confidence but with the GPS added and it says quite clearly there's no MMSI entered because I don't have an MMSI number to get one, I need to get a radio licence, and it's nice and easy and free to get one using the Ofcom website. I did have the ship's SSR number though, so I was able to get the existing MSI number for this boat to put into the new radio. I did a video with more detail on that, link in the description below. Ship Maritime Mobile Service Identity Numbers start with a country code, and the UK code is either 232, 233, 234, and in my case, it's 235. SOLAS regulations do not allow the user to change the MMSI number, so you only get one chance at inputting it, but you do get a chance to confirm it before you upload it permanently. Um, now, there we go, we've got, uh, we're, we're scanning, and you'll notice it's picked up the GPS can, can uh, the GPS position and the local time, um, and it's actually doing it through this tiny little wee wee thing here. I haven't decided where we're going to put it. Might stick it on the window. It seems to work okay there, um, and um, so I might leave it as long as it's working. Now the Garmin, this Garmin came with the boat, but interestingly, it's the same uh, Garmin that I had on. Uh, Confidence and Sea Dog. So if I turn this on, this is the bigger version, the 551. Mine was the 451. And I really do like this bit of, bit of machinery. But I know the software really well, which is very nice. You see the dates here, 2011. Needs updating. Select that. Charts. Navigation chart. And there we are, look. River Ancombe. And if I zoom out, that's us in position. So that's the summary. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please like and subscribe and thanks for watching. Caramel Macchiato. Remember that name, friends.